Okay, so welcome everyone. This is the third uh, block of the of the sessions of the Admor, Admor no, Admos uh, conference. Sorry, uh, my name is Sergio Slotnik, uh, and I will be chairing this session that is uh, called Industrial and Engineering Applications. Uh, we are going to have five talks. Uh, all related with these industrial engineering applications. Uh, three, the first three are more, um, are very applied. One in electromagnetism, uh, one in data assimilation uh, on a study of the ionosphere, one in um, a talk in uh, aluminium electrolysis and adaptive strategies to handle the, the multi-scale and multi-physics character of the problem. And then we have two other talks that are more methodological, but very related uh, with the application of numerical techniques in, in, in industry. Uh, the first one uh, by Chiso uh, about high order mesh generation. Um, complex topic and uh, another uh, the last talk will be on contact analysis and adaptive tracking in parallel environments so as always uh, I encourage you to write any question or comments in the in the chat uh, you can say uh, to which speaker the question is addressed and uh, we are going to have some discussion after uh, the presentations. So the first presentation is by Octavio Castillo Reyes uh, from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And the title is Modeling an Inversion of 3D Electromagnetic Datasets in HPC Platforms. Please go ahead with the video. Okay, yeah, I, I want to share my, my screen, right? Hello everybody, my name is Octavio Castillo Reyes. I'm postdoctoral researcher at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And today I'm going to introduce our most recent developments of electromagnetic modeling and inversion using uh, high performance computing and high order discretizations. So, uh, the main motivation of this work is that electromagnetic methods, both active and passive, can provide useful information to reduce uncertainty on uh, uh, exploration campaigns. Basically, all these methods are based on electric conductivity that provide a diagnostic of physical uh, properties. And the main advantage is that they are sensitive to fluid, they are cost effective, and they are uh, effective for soil characterization and monitoring and reservoir monitoring. On the other side, the second motivation is that in numerical simulations, nowadays have become expensive thanks to the use of high performance computing and the idea is that these numerical tools provide data that can uh, that we can use to validate our models by direct comparison between synthetic data and experimental data on this uh, regards and based on three on two points we are developing a parallel code for marine control source electromagnetic method and magnetoluric on, uh, in other words, we are providing, a, we're developing a parallel code for active source and passive source electromagnetic methods. And the idea is that this code can provide useful information for different range of application, such as oil and gas, geothermal exploration context, mineral exploration, and also volcanology. So uh, the idea is that I will provide, uh, we're developing the parallel code, the Python, a parallel code, which, which is the PETCAM code, which is uh, based on high order edge find element methods. It supports constructive and adapted meshes uh, based on a semi-automatic meshing approach, and it's, it's developing under open source uh, code. The idea is that I will provide two basic modeling ex uh, experiments that we are developing in the last, uh, in the last uh, days. The first one is related with the aptic source test, and this test is regarding on the Bayes Basin, which is considered as an important test suite to study and improve geophysical techniques. Also, this region is relevant because several geothermal anomalies are present there, 
And the idea is that we study or we investigate the impact of metallic, uh, the presence, the impact of the presence of the metallic borehole in the electromagnetic responses. This model is based on a geothermal exploration context. So the idea is that we compare the synthetic data provided by PETGEN against experimental data for this Pages region. Basically, you can see an excellent agreement for this between the PETGEN solution and against the experimental data. And in this region, you can see the impact of the presence of the borehole that increased the amplitude of the electromagnetic field. So with this data, with these experiments, we, com we confirm that the PETGEN code is able to produce accurate solution against experimental data. And uh, this is an example of control source electromagnetic method or active electromagnetic uh, method. Another size, the passive source test that is related with the magnet telluric is focusing on a model that uh, contains a strong resistivity contrast. The test under consideration is the Dublin, Dublin test model, which is a relevant modeling and challenging test in the, in the literature and in also in the community. And the idea to solve this problem is to verify the code capabilities to modeling extreme situations such as wide range of period. So this is the description of the model, that is a blocking model that in the geometrical point of view is not complex, but from the uh, range of periods is quite, is quite large. So again, the results are in good agreement with the reference uh, solution. So based on these two simple examples, the conclusion is that uh, the high order and uh, an adaptive mesh design is fundamental to obtain excellent uh, ratios in drop time and accuracy. Also, uh, by using this strategy, we can speed up the parallel code and we can obtain par an, an excellent parallel efficiency in high performance computing platforms. The idea is that our triple headed approach can be extremely competitive for the solution of realistic and complex electromagnetic uh, setups. Uh, and finally, this know-how that we are developing in the last years is fundamental for future de developing modeling tasks and developments. And basically, we will focus in now on implementing uh, electromagnetic uh, routines based, based on Monte Carlo and uh, Bayesian exploration uh, schemes. So that's all. Thank you for your attention and see you on the Atmos conference. Very good. Um, thank you very much, Octavio. Um, the next presentation is by Olga Maltseva uh, from uh, the Southern Federal University in Russia. And the title of the presentation is Assimilation Capabilities of the IRI Plans Model, IRM Plans Model. Uh, hello, everybody. This report uh, concerns uh, assimilation problems in the physics of the atmosphere and its practical applications. Uh, one of the applications is the providing the technological uh, system uh, with uh, uh, the ionospheric uh, information. Examples of uh, systems are given in this slide. Uh, ionospheric uh, parameters are presented on this slide. The uh, ionosphere uh, condition is set by models. Uh, however, they are uh, uh, average and for the use in real time, adaptation to values of parameter of current diagnostic is necessary. These models are the most used IRI, IRI plus, naked parameter of assimilation are presented in this part of table, featuring the uh, advantage of the uh, IRI uh, plus model. Uh, as a assimilation to uh, TEC. This uh, report is devoted to assimilation of TEC in the IRI plus model uh, to obtain latitudinal dependence of critical frequency uh, for European uh, meridian. Uh, as uh, time period, the uh, March of uh, 2012, uh, concerning uh, some magnetic uh, storm is uh, chosen, data of TEC are global uh, maps, uh, GPL. Uh, for uh, definition of uh, uh, F0F2, the equivalent slab thickness of the uh, ionosphere is used, unlike uh, other voids using uh, tau uh, 
uh, RI for the IRI model in the presented report the median of an experimental uh, sickness tau met is used uh, using tau met for uh, five anazoides latitudinal dependence uh, of uh, tau met is contracted by means of a polynomial uh, differences between uh, dependencies for two uh, approaches are shown in the figures. Further, this dependence is used to reconstruct values of f one Correspondence with the observational uh, data is resulted in the uh, table. It shows that the reconstructed uh, values can be used as experimental values between uh, stations uh, and in meridian. Uh, however, meridians along which um, are located in a zone this are very little, and it is necessary to have it a method of uh, F0, F2 uh, determination uh, from uh, observation TC on meridians uh, uh, where uh, run, uh, not present in Azontis. For this um, purpose, it is um, proposed to use uh, assimilation of TC in the IRI plus model. Efficiency of uh, assimilation is estimated by two uh, coefficients, uh, eta TEC and eta F0, F2. Uh, uh, examples are given for uh, low uh, latitude, middle latitude, and high latitude uh, points along a meridian. The first uh, plus show uh, conformity between observation and model TC after the assimilation. The second plus uh, uh, give relations of uh, tau of parameters. The third conformity of uh, F0, F2 uh, values. They show that the assimilated TC model can be used uh, for an estimation and studying of behavior of the atmosphere during disturbances. On uh, this uh, slide, statistical uh, estimations are presented for uh, TEC and F0, F2. They show that the IRI plus model provides uh, satisfactory uh, results uh, at middle and uh, high uh, latitudes. On uh, uh, this uh, slide, uh, are shown latitudinal dependencies of TEC and the critical frequency calculated from them for all days uh, of uh, the chosen disturbances. Red curves show behavior of frequency in each concrete day in uh, comparison with black curves, which uh, represent monthly uh, median. Advantage of uh, the RI plus model is the account of the plasmospheric part of an ash profile, as it is uh, the profile is integrated to a high GPS satellite another uh, 20,000 kilometers, uh, whereas the profile into the IRM model is integrated only to 2,000 kilometers. Uh, however, traditional practice uh, of comparison studying TEC is connected with the IRI model uh, in the uh, private uh, uh, assumption that the contribution of plasmospheric uh, part is small. The IRI plus model allows uh, one to define this contribution. Next uh, uh, plots uh, give contribution. Uh, of the uh, top side um, uh, part and plasma series part for several latitudes and uh, general uh, conclusion the uh, assimilation IRI plus model can be uh, powerful uh, tool for uh, research uh, of uh, ionosphere. Okay, thank you, Olga, for the presentation. Uh, the next talk is by Pari de Paselli, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, from Ecole Polytechnique de Lausanne. And the title of the talk is Adaptive Finite Elements with Large Aspect Ratio or Aluminium Electrolysis. Hello everyone, my name is Pari Pastelli, and today I present you my work, Adaptive Finite Elements with Large Aspect Ratio for Aluminium Electrolysis. Aluminium Electrolysis is a complex multi-physics problem describing the production of aluminium. We will focus on the fluid flow problem describing the movement of the two fluids involved, electrolyte and liquid aluminium, the green and the gray domain in this schema. We consider the following equation, where F is the source term arising from gravity and Lorentz force. We have some multiscale features because of the kind of domain we are using, the fluid domain that we can see below. And also we want to solve the problem using finite element methods. So we need a mesh and we want to construct a mesh that is a trade-off between accuracy and CPU time. 
we can observe here the usual mesh that we use, so we call it standard mesh, and here the mesh that we obtain with our method, the adapted mesh. I show here some results. We can observe the result obtained on the adapted mesh while solving the fluid flow problem. So the mesh and the corresponding obtained solution for two different cuts. And here we can see another cut where we have the obtained solution and the corresponding adapted mesh on the right. And on the left, the obtained solution using the standard mesh. As we can see, the standard mesh has approximately 320,000 vertices and takes about 13 hours to solve the fluid flow problem, while the adapted mesh has only 31,000 vertices and needs uh, uh, almost two hours to solve the fluid flow problem. So in practice, we reduce the CPU time, keeping the same accuracy. The strategy, the strategy that we use is the following. We will use an adaptive algorithm for the simplified Stokes problem, where F is the source term of the fluid flow problem. The anisotropic adaptive algorithm that we use is based on an error indicator. The error indicator can be observed here, and it's justified in uh, an article of Professor Picasso of 2005. We want to check the quality of the error indicator and the adaptive algorithm. Thus, we define these quantities, the anisotropic effectivity index, which is a ratio between the error indicator and the, uh, an error in a semi-norm, and the ZZ effectivity index, which describes the quality of the ZZ post-processing that is used to compute this omega k u minus u h. We also denote AR, the aspect ratio, defined by lambda 1k and lambda 3k. So we divide lambda 1k, the largest stretching direction of the tetrahedron k, by the smaller stretching direction. And we run our experiment for the following domain. So we choose a flat domain omega where f is given and is uh, such that the exact solution of the Stokes problem is the following. And we can observe the result obtained in this table. So in practice, we construct for each tolerance a mesh such that the error indicator is near to the tolerance, to the given tolerance. And for each tolerance, we can observe the number of vertices that we obtain, the error h1 in seminorm h1, the ZZ effectivity index that converge near to one, showing the robustness of the ZZ post-processing, and the anisotropic effectivity index, which is constant, showing that it's independent of the aspect ratio, which is increasing and dividing the tolerance and showing the anisotropy of the mesh. We can observe the obtained mesh in this figure with the corresponding solution. To conclude, we have a robust anisotropic adaptive algorithm for the Stokes problem. We use the algorithm to solve a simplified Stokes problem and obtain an adapted mesh, and we will use the obtained mesh to solve the fluid flow problem. In this way, we reduce the CPU time of a factor of 6.5, keeping the same accuracy when using the adapted mesh with respect to the standard mesh. As a perspective work, we want to justify the error indicator for the Navier-Stokes equation with a turbulent viscosity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pariede, for this fine talk. Uh, the next presentation is by Shi Tso uh, from Swansea University. Uh, and the title of the, of the talk is Tailored Mesh Generation for NEFM. Hello, everyone. My name is Shi Tso. I'm a postdoc researcher at Swansea University. Working together with Professors Ruben Sevilla, Obe Hassan, and Kenneth Morgan. It's a pleasure to join the Atmos conference today to present our recent work on tailored mesh generation for NEFM. This work is funded by the EPSRC of the UK and is also supported by these industrial collaborators. Modern numerical methods often require generating a mesh from a cut geometry which is typically represented by NURBS. To do this, the user will specify a desired mesh size. However, the resulting mesh often contains small elements due to the limitation of small features. Besides, in general, the boundary mesh is not geometrically conformal. Let's look at the typical feature. On the low frequency, this small feature has negligible 
influence to the results. Keeping it would cause excessive local refinement, so we may want to remove it. However, on the high frequency, removing it will cause great impact to the solution. In addition, the defeaturing is not fully automated, so you can see why in the industry more time is spent on preparing the mesh other than running the solver. To overcome such difficulties, more than a decade ago, an FM was developed. In FM, the CAD information is directly used, so it is able to represent complex boundaries within a single low-order element. In addition, it is sufficient to enhance only the elements at the boundaries, keeping the rest still traditional elements. Therefore, using an FM not only gives you a geometrically conformal mesh, but also avoids defeaturing. Thus, one can run the high-order solver on a more uniformly sized mesh, such as this example. Now, let's take a look at the NFM elements. For each NFM element, we construct the geometric mapping in a particular way, using the NOPES parameterization of the boundary. With the help of these maps, we can construct elements across multiple curves or multiple surfaces. For those elements, additional information has to be stored for the geometric supporting points or GS points. No degrees of freedom is defined on the GS points. So, how do we generate the mesh? Let's look at this model. This is a flat plate intersected with two cylinders. With this cut geometry, we first generate a traditional surface mesh, which contains many small elements, shown as red. Then, we move to generate the NFM surface mesh using a successive procedure along the intersection curves. It will update the connectivity in the node-centered patch. Then, we create the GS points and associate them to the new elements. Eventually, we obtain the preliminary NFM surface mesh. Afterwards, we post-process this mesh with smoothing, diagonal swapping, etc. to obtain a satisfactory result. Based on the NFM surface mesh, we then apply the modified advancing front method in 3D to obtain the tetrahedral mesh. Next, let's take a look at some examples of a surface mesh. This model has quite thin thicknesses on the side surfaces. The fan mesh cannot avoid small elements, while the net fan mesh does not contain any. The histograms clearly show the reduction of number of small elements. This is an aircraft engine ferry model. On the leading edge, there are four small surfaces which are very thin, and they bring small elements with larger spectral ratio in fan. In NFM, this is not the case. The two zoomed views show the details of the NFM mesh at the leading edge and the trailing edge. Here, different surfaces are colored differently. To conclude, we have developed the new surface mesh generator tailored for NFM, and soon we will move to the volume mesh generator. Then, we will devise new mesh quality metrics and integrate our mesh generator with existing solvers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Xi, for this uh, very fine talk. Uh, we move to the uh, last presentation of this session by Chili uh, Fang. And the title of the presentation is A Cross Partition Contact Analysis with Adaptive Tracking. Hi, I'm Chili Fan, and my talk today is about the modeling of contact in preload analysis. In the next five minutes, I will firstly talk about the difficulties in the parallelization of contact analysis when using traditional partitioning methods. Then I will introduce the parallel contact analysis method that developed in current work. 
considering that the size and the complexity of simulations are growing in a very fast pace. Parallel analysis has been vastly applied to file element problems. Before further discussion, it should be clarified that the current work is limited to coarse grain parallelization using domain decomposition methods. And the fine grain parallelization, such as some GPU aided analysis, is out of scope in the current discussion. Applying parallel analysis to file element problems with conforming meshes is relatively straightforward. A domain decomposition a domain decomposition scheme that previously developed in our research group is presented here as an example. As shown here, a bit structure is firstly split into multiple partitions and each of them are solved in independent processes simultaneously. Then the coupling between the different partitions is ensured over a predefined interface where a node-to-node -node connection is adopted. However, Unlike the conventional analysis for continuum bodies, quantum simulation across different partitions is not as straightforward. Here I will take the classical node-to-surface quantum element as an example. If we want to solve the upper and the lower bodies in different partitions, then to model the two surfaces in different partitions coming into contact, we might face three main problems using the domain decomposition method that divides for matching bits. Firstly, for the contacting surface in different partitions, it is communicationally heavy to obtain the contact-related parameters, including the contact points and the contact state. Also, it's difficult to check the contact pairs with the node-to-node -node domain decomposition methods, especially in a large sliding analysis. Lastly, the linearity between the slave nodes and the master facet will interfere with the independent solution of the two partitions in different processes. Regarding the above mentioned issues, we propose a pair of fully decomposed node to surface contact elements to discretize the contact boundaries in different partitions. There are four main considerations during the development of this contact pair. Firstly, rather than the displacement based partitioning interface, the current method adopts a Lagrange multiplier-based interface to allow for the interaction between the non-conforming meshes. Secondly, an assumption of small incremental displacement is adopted, implying that the closest projection of a slave node on the master facet and also the corresponding normal do not change significantly over one time or loading step. Based on this assumption, we we'll fully decompose each quantum element into a slave node and the master facet. Both of the slave node and the master facet are now directly linked to the Lagrange multiplier only during the iteration, and communication is only required at the end of each successful step. During the iteration, the contact state is predicted at the partitioning interface after assembling the local response. This treatment ensures the independency between the slave and the master body during iteration, uh, iteration. And it allows for a more flexible automation between the slave node and the master for space in context analysts involving large sliding. Based on this method, a strategy to effectively search for the contact region is also enabled, allowing for both um, a local checking of the master for state for each slave node, and also a global reallocation of the penetrating slave node. The effectiveness of the parallel contact method can be demonstrated by this model. It shows that the error induced due to the assumption of small displacement increment is insignificant enough, which is especially true for dynamic elements. Also, the optimum master to slave contact pairs across different partitions are successfully checked. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Gili. Um, good, so I, uh, we move now to the discussions. I encourage you all to, to, to post your questions to the, to the chat. So we have a couple. 
uh, the first one is to uh, to parry the and the question is uh, by Janice. Uh, the question is: Do you expect some complications when meshing problems involving turbulence, especially with special requirements for the discretization of the boundary layer? Hello, everyone. So yes, I think uh, we can have some troubles, but at the at the moment, I'm not entirely sure because I'm still on the theoretical side of developing uh, the error estimator. So I, I'm really into proving the estimator for the turbulent um, for the turbulent problem. But I think we will have some trouble. But uh, yes, I, I think it's it's gonna work. So it's not gonna be a hard problem. But uh, first of all, I need to really find the, the, the equivalence of the error with the, two, the estimator that I can derive, actually. So um, I hope not too strong a problem, actually. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, I, I have a question uh, uh, to, to Pari as well. Um, you showed some uh, table of errors for a, for a simple problem uh, with very nice properties, but you also show some simulation with, a, with let's say, a fine finite element mesh uh, and, and your uh, adapted uh, mesh. Do you have some estimation of the of the errors when you when you run, let's say, not not the not the, the small problem, but the, the, the industrial application or something closer to the industrial application? Uh, not really. The only thing that I have it's a comparison with the classical mesh that we use. So I can really see just that with this mesh, I, I can see that I obtain more or less the same precision. But I, I'm 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 not able to to say now if uh, I, if it's uh, converging well on this side. So what we think is that it's a way to obtain a mesh which is better than the usual one because have the same results, but uh, more efficiency. But uh, that's why we still want to, to really go into the, uh, into the um, not simplified problem, so the um, problem with turbulence, to really see if something changes and if it's worth it to use it. Maybe just uh, the simplified problem gives already a mesh, which is enough uh, well uh, to, to, to see the results, actually, and see the property for that. But no, we don't have a table saying as the property with the Navier-Stokes turbulent problem. OK, thank you very much. You. So we have a question from Frederick Larson to uh, to C. Uh, the question is, can you elaborate on the perspective for mesh generation from CAD data to industrial application? What is the degree of automatization possible today, and what are the difficulties? Okay, so thanks for this uh, very interesting question. And this is actually uh, what we are uh, working on. So I would like to share with you my screen. Uh, so can you see that now? Yes. Okay, great. So. Um, the thing is, uh, in industrial applications, uh, we always have some uh, complex shapes with multiple connected small surfaces. So first, we will need uh, some uh, robust uh, feature identification to, to capture those features when uh, the characteristic uh, mesh size is uh, close to those uh, size of these uh, small features. So for example, in, in this uh, uh, example, which is a flange, uh, at the beginning, we were uh, not able to capture some of the features. And secondly, uh, we, we will need to uh, handle those uh, so-called gathered small, uh, small surfaces. For example, here we have a notch. So here, this ring is a very small surface, very thin. And uh, it, it's uh, the, on the top of it, is the same and also this uh, small cylinder has a very uh, small uh, height and also here we have some clustered small surfaces which are quite challenging and currently uh, we are able to 
uh, sorry, I'll show you a video to generate a mesh like this. But still, there are some small problems that we need to fix. And at last, uh, we will need to uh, get a very uh, robust and a valid surface mesh before we are able to generate uh, valid and useful uh, volume mesh. I hope that uh, answers your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you just, uh, I know that this is, uh, this is the future, but once you have the, uh, a proper surface mesh that just um, uh, describes the geometry property, do you expect to have problems in generating the volume mesh? Yes. Uh, to generate a valid volume mesh, we will need to do uh, perform something called uh, visibility detection because uh, the nature of the NFM method, we will need to subdivide uh, the volume mesh into several, uh, let's say, uh, cells for the to perform the integration on the elements. So to be able to enable those uh, uh, integration, we will do perform some uh, uh, visibility detection from the, uh, let's say the fourth uh, vertex to the triangle surface. So that, that's uh, quite challenging. Okay, okay, good, good. Thank you very much. E. Thank you. So I have some questions uh, for Octavio. Um, yeah, sure. I'm here. Yeah. Um, the, the first one is related. Uh, you, you described um, uh, a very interesting uh, finite element uh, code using high order adapted meshes for these uh, electromagnetic problems. In the, but I, I understand that you're using this in the in the context of an inversion problem where you want to uh, obtain the the geometry and the structure of the of the earth uh, so why do you need adaptation there i mean what can you adapt um, in, in, yeah. in I think, my, my question is are, are you going to adapt your mesh during the inversion procedure uh, is that the idea, or you are trying to handle some, let's say, a priori information that you have on the on the region, and you want to just uh, modify that? Yeah, uh, I didn't mention that, but the, the meshing, the adapted meshing for to obtain accurate uh, solution in a feasible room time is needed. Uh, for only for mo forward modeling, we adapt the mesh based on the skin depth parameter. So that depends on the model that you because you have a prior knowledge about the, the model. However, for inversion, this process could not be applied directly. However, in our assumptions, in our models, we assume that we know some general structure of the model. So we assume, and based on this assumption, we adapt the mesh for the, for the inversion process. Okay, okay, good. And related to that, I have a question from Ruben Sevilla, uh, which is, what is the main benefit and the main limitation of solving the equations in the frequency? Well, the, usually the people solve the, the, the problem for this, for this kind of, for, for this kind of problem, the people usually solve for frequency domain and not for, for time domain. It's more common. It's just, I think that is a standard in the, the, the factor, not, not, and in our case, there are not uh, mostly the de developments for uh, electromagnetic modeling in time domain. In, in terms of, of uh, advantage is that there are a lot of data that could be uh, compared directly with uh, other solution. And we don't uh, try to transfer from frequency to, to time domain. So 
That's the main advantage. Okay. And, and uh, one last question so that I'm uh, interested in myself. Uh, when you solve the magnitude telluric problem, yeah. What are the boundary conditions that you apply on the on the walls? Uh, what do you what do you do to handle boundary conditions in that case? We are using homogeneous uh, Newman homogeneous condition. In the in the boundaries, we are using Newman con the boundary condition that depends of the magnetic field computed for a one D model. So for a 1D model, you compute the, 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 the magnetic field that could not be uh, homogeneous for a layer model that mm -hmm. depends on the dip in the, in the, in the direction. And uh, for this 1D uh, magnetic field, we project to each uh, of the boundary. OK. OK. That's something interesting. That, uh... I uh, I was uh, trying to understand several times, but it's not uh, not easy to, to. It's not easy. It's not easy to understand. And, and the, the literature doesn't mention the, the, the details for that boundary condition. That we, we we really we recently submit a paper, and when we try to describe in a comprehensive way the 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 description of this boundary condition. Good. Um, that's uh, I don't have any other question for Octavio. Thank you very much, Octavio. Are you welcome? Uh, so um another question for for uh for Chili Fang. Um this I, I didn't understand well what do you do with the adaptation uh, and, and the partitions. I, I, I didn't understand if you are moving, um, if, if, if you are moving your um, your uh, domain decomposition, if you are adapting the, the domain decomposition, so moving some part of the mesh from one processor to another, or if you, of, you or, or if you just are detecting the proper contacts between the processors. Ca can you clarify a little bit on, on that? Um, I think it's the latter one. I am um, finding the matching node to surface um, contact position between different processors. That's what I'm doing. OK, OK. So the, the, the communication, uh, you said that you are reducing the communication overload. Uh, this uh, is yeah. so. It, what in, in which way this is reduced? Where, where is the reduction come from? Um, I think the reduction is mainly comes from um, because during the contact analysis, we're supposed to always um, communicate between the information, such as where the slave node is projecting on the master surface. Um, and also what's the normal from the closest projection point on the master surface, et cetera. And then because I use an assumption of a small displacement increment, which basically turning a nonlinear contact into a linear contact in a stepwise. Um, so it becomes a stepwise linear scenario so that the communication will only appear um, they will only communicate during um, after say one equilibrium uh, one equilibrium step is finished. So rather than doing the um, communication, do, uh, doing the communication during the, the, um, the iteration, I do it only once every step so oh. that it you reduce the Good. Uh, Good. communication. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Lee. Thank you. So um, I think that that was uh, it out the questions. Uh, I don't have anything else on on the chat. Uh, if every, if someone wants to add some question or comment, uh, you can do it right now. 
And otherwise, we are going to close this session. And let me just share my screen for a moment. Good. So we are 10 minutes in advance. Uh, and then we have the lunch break until 1.30. And at 1.30, we have the next session that is mesh adaptation techniques and numerical simulations part three. So um, thank you uh, to all the speakers for the very nice presentations and, and thank you for all the participants and the audience for, for, for the discussion. We leave it here. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.